Uh, thank you, Robert, for inviting me uh, to share this Black History Month event. And I thank all of you for coming out. Uh, I'd written down, uh, I was going to thank you for defying the lousy weather, but it turned well, so you can strike that. <laughs> thank you for coming out in the nice weather. Uh, allow me to introduce myself, as Count Dracula said. Uh, I'm Norman Thomas Marshall. I am an actor, and I co-authored and performed in a one-man play called John Brown, Trumpet of Freedom. I'm not a freedom fighter, but I play one on television, and mostly the theater, but not really on television. And uh, I also, I want to salute the Connecticut citizens in history of given their uh, given valuable service to the struggle for racial and justice and human freedom. Prudence Crandall, Marion Anderson, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Paul Robeson, a Fortune, the Slave Fortune, Venture Smith, Constance Baker Motley, and of course my personal hero, John Brown, uh, who was born barely a stone's throw from here in, in Torrington. I have to admit that I'm a little sheepish about uh, conducting a Black History Month event. You know, but it's not the first time that a white man is... You can finish that sentence any way you like. But I do hope that a white country boy from the segregated South, uh, who grew up to be the portrayer of John Brown, will have something to offer uh, for Black History Month. And speaking of Black History Month, may I suggest another name for it? I suggest that we call it American History. The black men and women who built this nation should have their story told in the mainstream of American history. Now, do you really think that we should have a Jewish American History Month and a Creole History Month? Uh, a Greco-Roman American History Month. No, I think we can uh, get along without segregated history. Because black folks built this nation's economy, which was based on tobacco, rice, and king cotton. That is American history. Benjamin Banneker and a core of enslaved people built Washington, D.C. and the White House and and many of those early government buildings, that is American history. And the jazz, uh, jazz and the blues are the defining cultural artifact of our society, and that is American history, full stop. Well, I was a sophomore in high school in, uh, when Brown versus Board of Education came down, 1954. So I came up in Hanover County, Virginia, which was a rural uh, agricultural community that was actually racially integrated, if you don't count church, school, restaurant, toilets, water fountains, and beds. Uh, maybe haystacks behind the barn, but not beds. Black and white alike all had to get up and go to work in the same fields every dawn. No ghettos in Hanover County. Now, being poor white trash, if I may use a technical term, I, 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 my parents hired me out as a field hand uh, from the age of seven. And my first job was picking black-eyed peas in Joe McGee's pea patch for 25 cents a bushel. And the uh, first day I picked uh, about a half a bushel, but he gave me the whole quarter anyway. Generous guy. But most of the field hands were black, and I spent many of my days of childhood working entirely in the company of, of black men and women. And I became witness to something that I think probably very few white people have ever seen. I saw both sides of what W.E.B. Du Bois called the double consciousness. I saw it in action, and others have called it the trickster. Like black tricksters, for instance, inhabited early Hollywood movies. Uh, there was Mantan Moreland, and uh, there was uh, Nico Demas, and Eddie Rochester Anderson, and uh, Butterfly the Queen. They were all these uh, 
sort of black clowns that uh, uh, that were in, were in so many of these early movies. And the princes of Hollywood required them to portray blacks in a manner that fit the racist stereotypes demanded by white audiences. But perhaps the greatest of the tricksters, uh, the trickster actors, was Stephen Fetchett, who was a brilliant comic actor who presented an American, uh, an African American who was so stupid and so slow and so trifling that it was a wonder that his heart remembered uh, to beat. And yet, he always got his way, the trickster. Now, around 1969, along with a friend, I attended a play in New York City that uh, featured Better Fly Me Queen, uh, who had played Prissy in Gone with the Wind. And after the show, I, uh, my friend and I, we went backstage to congratulate the cast, because I knew several of the people in it. And, but my friend, from the dear old Southland, she spotted Ms. McQueen in the green room and went into a burlesque of uh, you know, Prissy's famous lines in, in Heart with the Wind. You know, I don't know nothing about birth, no babies. Well, Butterfly went into a screaming paroxysm. Her feelings were so badly hurt. I, I mean, I've never seen such a tantrum. I mean, I mean, if it could have captured the energy of that, we wouldn't be worrying about the global warming in this day. But my friend was utterly aghast that she should take offense. What the hell's the matter with her? Well, we field hands would, would all meet the farmer at dawn and be assigned our hose or whatever tools we were going to use that day. And the boss man would appoint a foreman and he would break, he would joke around with the workers and Inevitably, one or more of the, do, one or more of the guys who would, would horse around with the landowner and the black guys would be laughing and joking, lots of yes sirs and lots of no sirs and that's right sir, falling down laughing at all the white man's jokes. Then the uh, white man yells, okay, everybody get to work, and then he goes back to the house to probably tune in the hog market reports on the radio. Then, there's no more laughter. The ones who did all the calming and they would do a Jekyll and Hyde thing. They sort of turn mean and angry and curse the white man. Oh, that mother, he still owes me eight dollars from raking leaves on the side of that hill. They were no longer the happy darkies that the Dixiecrats told us about. When the white man left, Uncle Remus left too. Now, I lived amid uh, Confederate shrines. There was Gaines Mill, Beaver Dam Creek, Chickahominy River, the White House, Coal Harbor Cemetery. They were all within walking distance. Now I'm calling out these names of uh, places in case there's any Civil War buffs uh, here. In fact, I walked over nearly every square inch of that territory working on those farms. And in, I often turned up Civil War relics in the soil that I was holding, bullets and many balls and uh, 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 fragments of shells, and, I, and actually it was so common that, you know, I would not necessarily just even bother to bend over and pick them up, especially if the boss man was watching. But, but how would like, you know, belt buckles and buttons, uh, bayonets, you know, they, they were artifacts worth something, or, or unexploded ordnance, which was found occasionally, and uh, my history teacher, Mr. McLaren, he lost several fingers when he was sawing in half an unexploded piece of ordnance that had been launched 90 years earlier. Now, us white folks worship the Confederate saints, you know, Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, Mosby, and the rest. But Edmund Ruffin was our local hero from Hanover County, and the spawn of his spawn was still living in Hanover County when I was growing up. I went to school with with the Betty Ruffin and Jane Ruffin and Julie Ruffin and, and the four Moran boys whose mother was a Ruffin. Now Edmund Ruffin was 62 years old when he enlisted in the Confederate Army. He was a plantation owner, a very ardent secessionist and, erratic, and he was very radically pro-slavery. And he lives in history as the man who fired the cannon at Fort Sumter that started the Civil War. 
And a few days after Robert E. Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox, Edmund Ruffin blew his brains out. It took him two tries. The musket misfired, but he affixed a new cap and again pulled the trigger. The second time uh, he did a little better. But he chose not to live in what he called slavery under Yankee oppression. Seems like slavery is cool as, as long as you ain't a slave, you know. The Edmund Ruffin started the war that killed nearly 800,000 Americans, and my people call him a hero. So that's where I'm coming from. And uh, speaking of Virginia, too, and how fortunate are we to have, during Black History Month, the governor and the attorney general of the great commonwealth branching around in blackface. Talk about your teachable moments. Well, I suggest we get over this scandal soon because I do not think the media will want to extend a Black History Month scandal into white women's history months. Now, full disclosure, 1952, I wore blackface in the seventh grade <coughs> menstrual show. Menstrual shows were very common uh, where I came from. They were done for charitable fundraisers. It's sort of a toss-up as to which was more popular as fundraisers, a menstrual show or a womanless wedding. Now, if uh, menstrual shows and blackface have something to say about race, I just wonder what womanless weddings have to say about uh, whatever. I mean, just think of some six foot four onion farmer with a five o'clock shadow that Nick's would envy walking, prancing, mincing down the aisle in a bridal veil. Very popular among the, the sons of the Confederacy. But uh, before our blood pressure gets too high, so we start bleeding from our ears, uh, you know, let's try to think of blackface more broad-mindedly, if you will. Let's be mature. After all, Abraham Lincoln adored minstrel shows, and he loved inward jokes, and he is the great emancipator. The Birth of a Nation is widely regarded as the greatest movie ever made, and it extensively uses blackface to insult and degrade African Americans. Then Al Jolson, has been said to be the greatest entertainer in our history. He worked in blackface and he starred in the first talking film, The Jazz Singer in Blackface. So you see, it's hard to talk about blackface without talking about greatness. Jimmy Kimmel, Billy Crystal, Jimmy Fallon, Sarah Silverman, Gail Collins recently pointed out in her New York Times article that all of those folks have recently done TV shows in blackface. And most tragically, Burt Williams, the legendary black comedian who W.C. Fields called the funniest man I ever saw, was required to work in blackface. So it's not enough that white entertainers insulted blacks, but black entertainers were forced to insult themselves. What's the harm, huh? Now, there might be some validity to the notion that wearing blackface or some other mask is fun. It is at the core of the dramatic arts, of which I have been an honest practitioner for the last 55 years. And it has been said, and notice the passive voice in that statement, it has been said that acting is the most fun you can have standing up. But it is inexcusable for the governor of Virginia or anybody else to inflict the kind of pain that I saw Butterfly McQueen respond to and then claim it to be it all, all in good fun. I didn't know any better. We need to learn better. It has never been acceptable. Not when I did it in seventh grade, and not when Abraham Lincoln invited it into the White House, and certainly it is not acceptable when it is done in our day and time by somebody like the governor of Virginia who was in medical school training to be a healer, a healer. 
white people need to learn to empathize with black pain. We don't. And we need to do that. Well, now I'll finally get around to John Brown. I went around, I, I, I could, I, for 24, the last 24 years, I've walked around with John Brown in me and all around me as a source of perpetual inspiration. I've lost uh, track of the number of performances that I've given over the years, but there are hundreds and hundreds. I've performed it all over the nation, Europe, and so forth. But just uh, trying to bring the, the story, trying to get more understanding about this American hero that uh, so many people have no knowledge of because uh, historians and history books have distorted so much of the record about John Brown. And at the beginning, of West, when I do the play, I start out the play by, you know, in my own persona, I ask the question to the audience. I said, if you were alive in the United States in the middle of the 1850s and you sincerely wanted to take an action to enslave the American South, what would you do? Would you go and listen to another moral suasionist speech by uh, William Lloyd Garrison? He had been giving those speeches for 30 years. And in that time, he had not turned around a single slave owner, not one. He had not freed a single enslaved person in 30 years. Also, maybe you would uh, work for the election of Abraham Lincoln. But Lincoln had no, uh, had, had, he had no desire to end slavery. He only wanted to slow down its expansion in the West. He was not an abolitionist. He was perfectly willing to accommodate slavery where it existed. Or would you say, as did the remarkable runaway, heroic runaway, Shields Green, given the option of going back to Rochester with Frederick Douglass or going to Harper's Ferry with John Brown, he said, I believe I'll go with the old man. Now, some historians have besmirched Brown's reputation by charging him with all manner of insanity and barbarism, and, but there's a ton more evidence that questions the psychological stability of Abraham Lincoln than there is to question the sanity of John Brown. And while we're talking about Lincoln, let me just quote him from a, a speech that he made during the Lincoln-Douglas debates, in his quotes in the play. The Negro is not my equal in any respect. I am not, nor have ever been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. There is a physical difference between the white and the black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. But while they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior and I am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. And some more of the, the uh, long-standing anti-Brown arguments was that uh, he was a terrorist and all that. And, and, well, he was a rebel, revolutionary, no doubt. But so was George Washington, founding fathers. They were revolutionaries. But I have yet ever to hear a discussion of Washington and those folks. I mean, you can't have a, Brown, a discussion about Brown without going into his psychological profile. I mean, you know, that, uh, there are some rumors, whispers, that Nathan Hale might have been a terrorist, but they're not very loud. Nobody hears them. The, the image of, of, of John Brown as a bloodthirsty killer is refuted by understanding that Brown held the entire town of Harper's Ferry at his mercy, at his whim, for many hours. He held more than 50 hostages. Not a single hostage was harmed. And Brown allowed several of the hostages to leave their captivity and go and take care of some urgent business on the condition that they would return. And they did. 
Even the hostages thought enough of him that they voluntarily returned to their captivity because they found the integrity of the old man unshakable. If John Brown were a sadistic killer, what a swath of blood he could have left in Harper's Ferry. Or to look at the uh, so-called Potawatomi Massacre. Many of our history textbooks like to call that an act of terrorism. They argue that Brown killed five men in cold blood simply because of a political disagreement over slavery. Now, Louis A. De Caro, who is a historian who has done at least four biographies of Brown, points out that if there was any terrorism around there, it was the pro-slavery forces, the border riders from Missouri, who were terrorizing the settlers. They were the terrorists. But there, you know, there were camps in that region around in Missouri, Kansas, where immigrants from southern states, mostly, were being, uh, there were immigrants sponsored by slave-owning interest to bring them into the territory so they would be there to vote for the referendum. Uh, later on, that would determine whether Kansas came into the Union as a free state or a slave state. So, Brown posed as a surveyor named Isaac Smith, and he went into one of these camps and was pretending to be surveying. And he, and actually, Brown was a surveyor, so he knew what he was doing. And, but he, he started interviewing these people. They were all close pro-slavery, but he ran across a man named James Doyle. And James Doyle proudly told Brown that he was from Tennessee and that he was there to help put down these uh, free state people, these abolitionists. And, but particularly, he was commissioned to get rid of those damn Browns. So Brown, John Brown knew who his killers were. He, he knew exactly the names of the men who were assigned to murder him and his family. And at that time and place, of course, there were no police forces, no constabulary, no military units, nothing that would protect an abolitionist family against the violence and the terrorism of the pro-slavery border riders. It was open season on abolitionists. John Brown entered three houses that, that night in Potawatomi, and an aggregate, probably 20, 25 people were in those three houses. John Brown did what he had to do. He took the five men that he knew had been assigned to murder him and his family. He took them out and killed them. If he had been a terrorist, he could have done so much more damage but he spared all, um, spared all the folks except for the ones that he knew were there to kill him. And, and by the way, there's a good argument that I've heard argued that uh, that kind of preemption without a police force or any kind of protection, societal protection, that would be permitted under English common law. And uh, parenthetically, I think the people who believe in stand your ground I mean, maybe they, they, they're pro-John Brown, too. But anyway, to get to the play, uh, here is a scene that shows Brown first becoming acquainted with the brutality of slavery. Uh, I was a youth, newly arrived on the threshold of manhood, just 12 years old. And I was driving some cattle with an older man to supply our army during the War of 1812. Now, when we had sold our cattle, when we turned, he invited me to his home, and I was an honored guest, and he made much of me to his family and his, and his neighbors. In truth, he made me feel like visiting royalty, and I felt a great warmth and kinship with this man and his family. I had never before seen an African chained to a post in their yard they kept a black slave, just a boy like me. He didn't even have whiskers on his face. He was naked and half starved and it was obvious he could not live through the winter. They made him sleep outside in the bitter cold with only a thin blanket to cover him. 
I heard the kind voices of my companion and his family turn harsh with abuse as they ridiculed and tormented this poor slave. They whipped him savagely for the slightest infraction and fed him only the most vile scraps, riding garbage that even their hogs would have refused to eat. And once, when they caught him stealing a bit of decent food, I saw him beaten with an iron shovel until blood gushed from his wounds. I became sick at the sight of it, but this man was unabashed in his cruelty. He said to me, <laughs> Hey, sir, sir, you gotta remember that a nigger ain't nothing but a two-legged mule. If you don't whip them, they start to thinking that they're your old master. <laughs> that maybe you'll have a few slaves working for you when you grow up. I hope you remember this lesson so you'll know the right way to treat them when the time comes. <laughs> There's nothing to stop it, to my everlasting shame. Well, that, that uh, scene, that, that is a scene uh, which pretty accurately shows how John Brown became radicalized over the issue of slavery. Now, the, my co-author of the play, George Wolf Riley, and I, we realized that the play was rather bloody. And so we attempted to inject a bit of sly humor into the text to relieve some of the more distressing aspects of the narrative. And, uh, so this is a scene that George and I intended to be blatantly comic. Uh, and we, we equated uh, this scene to the knocking at the gate scene during the, uh, the Scottish play just before the murder of King Duncan. Now, in, in actual fact, John Brown and the Raiders commandeered breakfast from a Harpers Ferry restaurant tour. Uh, we looked everywhere we could, but we could not find a video of that news conference. So uh, we thought we'd just sort of reenact it. So Mr. Throgmorton addresses the press. Well, kids, y'all can tell y'all those readers that the first I ever heard of this, uh, John Brown, I was right here Baking some biscuits, and I heard a voice order breakfast for 58 men. <laughs> 58 breakfast, man. So I thought I was going to make me some money that day, and then I seen who had called out the order. And Lord Almighty, there he was in my place of business and Africa. <laughs> I told him he'd have to wait outside while I fried up the eggs and says, but first, he better pay for it. That's a hundred eggs. That's three months work for a hen. I, I couldn't take a risk on that. It wouldn't be fair to the chicken. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, well, the raid on Harpers Ferry ended badly for Brown and his raiders. Uh, but he was captured and tried by the state of Virginia. And he was convicted after deliberating, or the jury deliberation of only about 45 minutes or so. And then uh, here's the speech based on John Brown's response in the courtroom. I have, may it please my judges, a final word to say. In the first place, I never did intend murder or treason, only freedom for those held in bondage. Had I so interfered on behalf of the rich and powerful, or on behalf of any of their friends, it would have been deemed an act worthy of reward rather than punishment. This court claims to acknowledge the law of God. At least I saw a book kissed in this courtroom that was supposed to be the Bible. That book teaches me that all things that men would do to me I should do even under them. It further admonishes me to remember them that are in bonds as I am bonded with them. All that I have done is to endeavor to live up to those instructions and I believe to have interfered as I have done is no wrong but right, God's right. 
The scaffold holds no terror for me. I go to a rosy dawn and a better day, but they must do battle with the demons that they have created. Six weeks later, John Brown climbed the gallery stairs. In the vast crowd that came to witness his execution, there was Stonewall Jackson, Edmund Ruffin, and John Wilkes Booth. I am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will not be purged away but by blood. I had vainly flattered myself that without very much bloodshed it might be done. You have sown the wind. Now you will reap the whirlwind. And if it is now deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life for the furtherance of justice and mingle my blood with the blood of millions of slaves whose rights and lives have been disregarded by wicked, cruel, and unjust enactments, then I submit. Then I say, let it be done. With his terrible swift sword, his truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Tomorrow, when they place his remains aboard the train, that will be the last that we will hear of this Osawatomie B. Brown. Signed, Robert E. Lee. Thank you.